what the heck is going on, right? If you don't know that, it's hard to be an effective citizen, right? As passionate as you may be, it's how much time do you have to do these things? You know, we're all busy with our families and our businesses. We don't have unlimited time. So the easier it is for us to get a hold of some of these key documents, whether it's a budget or an agenda or some planning documents or some other things of this nature, uh, to understand what your government is doing and what it plans to do. The easier it is to do that, the easier it is for you to be effective citizens. And the more time you have to waste just figuring stuff out, the less the time you have to actually impact that. You know, in other words, to weigh in and go, I like it, I don't like it, but well, what do you think? Should we show of hands? You know, that kind of stuff. The democracy stuff. Well, until we get the information, really, it's, it's kind of hard to do democracy. And uh, not to be you know, sentimental about it, but you know, the founding fathers and mothers who put this country together had this idea that in order to uh, entrust the government to us, the folks, we had to be smart. We had to be smart, we had to be informed. I know it sounds you know, like from your civics textbook, but that is the God's honest truth. They expected us to be smart. And that's why newspapers and the press is protected in the Constitution. So we find ourselves in a situation here, and not just uh, Woodstock or Chicago, but in America, where there's a bunch of things sort of com come together to make a perfect storm of civic ignorance. So on the one hand, we have our newspapers falling, falling about. Maybe you have a good press here. Maybe you have, you know, uh, it's a daily or whatever. I'm not familiar with your local press or your local TV or radio. But in Chicago, our major newspapers have been in and out of bankruptcy. And so they've laid off city hall reporters. There's just not a lot of bodies, you know, to cover these key issues. Our city council in the city of Chicago is a rubber stamp and routinely appreciate uh, and approve whatever is put in front of them, regardless of what it is. Um, and that has been true for 50 years. And the current city council is only marginally better than it's been historically. So if you're, let's put it this way, if you're hoping in the city of Chicago for the city council to watch your back, no, no it's not going to happen. Then there's major nonprofits, and I call them the bobbleheads. You know bobbleheads? Mm. These major downtown civic organizations tend to agree with any bad, crappy plan that's placed in front of them by what I call big capital, big projects, like you know, pouring a lot of concrete. And there's usually a few planning agencies that are pushing these projects. And so those, that perfect storm, you know, a bad plan is, is, is advocated, and they trot it in front of these decimated newspapers who don't have the uh, staff to push back. It gets blessed by the editorial board, and the next thing you know, it's, it's, it's the writ, whatever this bad plan is. And we, the people out here, if we don't have the time to digest all this, we go, oh, look, the Olympics are coming to Chicago. Honey, what do you think? Isn't that great? Well, I don't know. The, and it, the Tribune loves it, you know, and it, it just seems like a good idea, right? You move on. Well, hold the phone. Yeah. A group of us in Chicago didn't take that stuff, and we did our own due diligence. It was called No Game Chicago, and we were a group of volunteers. Uh, we had a grandma. We had a retired uh, lawyers, and we had a few old school organizers like me. We didn't even have an office. The Olympic Committee in Chicago raised $90 million. They had the mayor, they had the president, and Oprah, yeah. all waving the Olympic flag. The Olympics is the biggest brand, one of the biggest brands on the planet. It's recognized by just about every living creature. Uh, and it has that high emotional, like, oh, I, you know, it's the little kids tumbling and the big beefy guys lifting weights and the brotherhood of sport. BS. It's just a lot of BS. Well, the more we looked into it, the less we liked it. But wh who else? It was telling that story. So this is just an example, but it was a big example of, of something that was going to come to Chicago, pushed by all the powers that be, uncriticized by the local press, and just sort of washes over the, the population, you know, with, backed up with by a lot of money. You know, in this case, it was marketing and signage and endorsements and, and like I say, Oprah. Well, we outthought them. We outfought them and we outthought them and we killed the bid in the first round of voting. And we know we had an effect. But that was, that journey is, in, is indicative of, of, of who I am and why I'm here. So in the, in the run up to the Olympic fight, we kept running across the, the um, narrative from the city that we were broke. And we're hearing that quite a lot in Chicago. 
And because we're broke uh, and we have no clue as to how to have economic uh, development that's just and equitable, not just to, for the mayor's friends, since we, we have no clue of that, we're going to do these cockamamie plans like the Olympics, and it's going to be fantastic. That was the narrative we were fed. Well, we got a hold of, uh, in the uh, No Games group of uh, the TIF reports, tax increment finance reports, and that's really the start of my work in this area. And, and we found that, in, in fact, that Chicago was not broke. So let's get into it. That's a little bit about me and my background. Um, this is our 43rd meeting since we started the TIF Illumination Project in February of 2013. We've been all over the city of Chicago and a little bit outside. This is the farthest we've come, so thank you <laughs> for bringing the TIF Illumination all the way out to McHenry County. Um, and we're, we're just delighted to be here. Um, the, the, the TIF Illumination Project is a, a work of the Civic Lab. Uh, we use data mining, investigatory journalism, map making, and graphic design to answer the question, what is a TIF anyway? Why should I care? And most importantly, what's the impact of where I live? And you guys live here. As I, as I say, we mo did mostly in the city of Chicago, 141 TIF districts across 33 wards uh, in front of about 4,500 people. We've had 80 stories written us about us in the local press. Interestingly, the Sun-Times and the Tribune and the WBEZ have not covered our work, even though <laughs> we've been everywhere. Um, it gets to sh show you about when you poke your finger in the eye of power, um, you disappear from a, a lot of the radar. But we, we soldier on. Um, I'd like to say that, you know, despite the fact that we have no money, we have impacted the civic dialogue in the city of Chicago, and hopefully we are going to do so here. We'll start a civic dialogue, perhaps about some of these issues, and I'm very proud of this work. Okay, so the thing that, there's some, some I guess I could say 50,000 foot altitude questions I'd like you to keep in mind as we move through this material. And basically, the material is about half and half. The first half is kind of like, what is a TIF? How does it work? And maybe, we, you know, we, we can stop for Q&A because it, it gets a little geeky. If, if you have a question in this first part, you know, we'll try to get through them. But then the second part, we zoom in on, on where we are. So today we're in Woodstock. But in the other situations when we were in a, in a, in a specific ward, we would, we would talk about the tips of that place, of that ward, the 13th ward, the 23rd ward, or whatever. So it made it very, very particular for the uh, attendees. Okay, the first question is, under what circumstances do we give public money to private businesses? Under what circumstances does your tax money get transferred to a private business? Okay, because that's kind of the game here uh, under, the, under the guise of economic development. But that's essentially what you're proposing, and, and this is just one way that you, we, we transfer public, what I would call public assets, in this case your property tax dollars, uh, to a private whole, you know, stakeholder, a, a business person, a developer, or something of this nature. And is it okay to do that? And if so, what, under what uh, rubric? Do you, do you get to weigh in on? You know, how, how does that happen, if it happens? Number two, who plans what for whom? We're gonna do something in order to have community development. So your community is undeveloped. Well, what does that mean? And what do I need to make it developed? And again, that's a giant kind of a highway that a lot of trucks drive down. And unless you are in on the conversation, you can get your community developed in a way that you don't like, because someone else answered it for you. And Chicago, of course, is famous for big plans. You know, we're always bragging about the Burnham Plan from 1909. But um, the, the mindset that developed the Burnham Plan 100 years ago is not appropriate, in my opinion, for a lot of uh, urban America. But that still drives a lot of planning in the city of Chicago, and it's unquestioned. So. I am about asking questions. So who's, who's defining what a developed community looks like, I guess, is what we want to think about. Uh, and are we broke? And what about funding essential public services? As I say, the narrative in Chicago is we are so broke, the mayor is asking for another $500 million in property taxes, as well as they're going to slap fees on garbage collection, bowling, um, 
Netflix, I don't know what else, you know. Um, so is that okay? And, you know, I don't know what the situation here is in Woodstock, but, you know, the whole state is hurting, isn't it? Yeah. And we're getting this dialogue from our state leaders that the state is bleeding money and therefore a certain set of conditions must follow. And I, and I, I want to push back on that. And you'll see, you'll see why. So are we broke? You know, or another way to put it is what is the true state of our finances? Do we, do we feel that we have a grip on them? Do we have a grip on them? And who's watching our back? <laughs> I think I'm pretty plain in my, in my uh, analysis of, of Chicago where I don't think anyone's watching our back. I mean, that's how I feel as a citizen activist these many years. You know, the No Game Chicago fight was just one of many fights I've had with the mayor. <clears throat> but I always feel, um, you know, where's all these other groups, you know, like nonprofit groups or, um, you know, the universities or somebody who should be sort of helping us collectively sort of watch our backs when these crappy pro projects are pr proposed, whatever they might be. And therefore, I, I, I um, ask us to think about, you know, where are our leaders going to come from? What is a TIF? TIFs were started in California in 1952. They came to Illinois in 1977. We were the 25th state to adapt this. These TIFs, these TIF districts, can last up to 23 years, but they can be extended for another 12. <clears throat> They're used as a financing mechanism to get something built uh, that wouldn't authorize be able to be built. So we, we are introduced to this concept of blight and the but-for condition. Uh, so um, the idea is I want to build a little strip mall or a little, wall, a little mall with a Walgreens, you know, and a pizzeria in it, something like that, in a part of your community that is blighted. <clears throat> now in Chicago, blighted usually means people of color who are poor. But in other parts of the country, blighted could mean just poor people, or um, the area is sort of neglected and it's kind of seedy looking. So there's this kind of a definition that you might, in your head, when I say the word blight, it might meet, trigger an image. But basically, the banks have left that area. So the bank is saying, Tom, you know, it's great you want to build your little mall with the Walgreens and the pizzeria in it, but the area you wish to build in is dangerous or dicey. And if you build your thing, it will, f it will have a high probability of failing because of the blight or the blighted people. People will steal from you or you won't be able to rent your little stores or they'll, it's, it's too risky, Tom. And so the money I'm going to get, I can lend you the money, but it's going to be very, very expensive, like 20 points. But if you want to take the risk, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to, to profit from your risk taking. <clears throat> but I say I can't make it work because if I, if I take the loan at that rate, I'll have to charge rent so high that, you know, I can never get my project off the ground. My project will fail and the whole thing will be a bust. Is, is there any way I can get some help? Can I get some help? It's a for-profit project owned by me, but I can, can I get some help? And if there is a TIF district, the answer is yes, you can. So TIFs are created by cities. Uh, the law is a state law, but the TIF district itself is created by your municipality and operated by your um, economic development unit, uh, you, whatever it's called, in, or the Department of Planning, say. And um, the TIF district would be created, uh, for me in this case, and say um, it looks like this. And, you know, here's First Street and here's Third Street. And here's, you know, X Avenue and Y Avenue. And uh, I want to build the project right here. So the city draws its TIF boundaries, and they do it in such a way uh, as to maximize the, the revenue that is going to be needed for my particular project. And I can get up to 30%. So say if my, say if my project is, um, you know, $10 million to build my little mall, I can get maybe three, four, depending on what I'm asking for, and it's only for physical things. So the TIF money that I'm asking for can be used for acquisition of the property, if I don't own this, remediation, and that's actually what happened here, or um, some kind of help me with my financing. So it's, it's for physical construction. 
That's a very important. So, okay, with my little scenario here, um, we've created a TIF district, uh, and my project's gonna be there. Now, what, the t what, what we do now, what the county does, is they count up all the properties that are already in the TIF district, however many there are. And let's say there's 100 properties in year zero. So the TIF hat is just being created. 100 properties across the TIF, and the property taxes thrown off by all these properties are, say, $1,000. Okay? So that's, 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 our, that's our start. Now, it's important to remember this. This $1,000 is the base. So that's our technical term. That's our first technical term, the base. This $1,000, which is being collected by these properties, um, where does the $1,000 go? So in McHenry County, or in Woodstock, $1 of property tax is spent how? What's the biggest user of your property tax? Schools. Schools, correct. Um, and you know how much they get? Yeah, let's call it 67 cents. That's actually higher than Chicago. In Chicago, it's about 56 cents. But this is very typical. And on the side here about funding local government, Illinois, as you probably know, is the, one of the most regressive states in America in its terms of its income tax. So a regressive state means Richer folks do not pay, they, they pay the same as the poorer folks. So I think we have a flat rate of whatever, it's 3.75 or something like that. Um, so the person making 100 million pays the same percentage as the person making 30,000. 30, That's regressive. Uh, and because, that, because of that, uh, Illinois forces municipalities to uh, rely very heavily on its property tax for schools, which ends up being a crapshoot by zip code. So a kid raised in one zip code where there's a low uh, tax base, might, his schools might suffer. His schools might be poorly funded. But five miles away, if there's a, a, a mall or the, it's a richer community or whatever the case may be and the property tax base is higher, those schools will be flush. And in my earlier years, I was an actor with Urban Gateways and we toured schools all over the three county area and we saw in the space of, of days, you know, when my partner and I would be touring our Shakespeare, Shakespeare's men and women, forsooth, uh, uh, we would go to a, uh, a suburban school and it would be like a college campus. I mean, it lacked for nothing. And, it, and, and their theater looked like, like a Broadway theater. And then the next day we'd be in an inner city urban school and it looked like a bomb zone. So that's the reality of, 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 of uh, property taxes in the state of Illinois. What else do your, do your property taxes fund here besides the schools? So the county itself gets some. Uh, the, your city? Well, so yeah, all the unimissible, unimissible services, you know, so the part of your property taxes finds its way into the city, yeah? You know, I just heard that Cook County actually pulls more of our school funds. It's not a direct payment from our taxes of 67% that go directly to the schools. The money goes to Springfield, and then Springfield does something oh. with it, and Cook County gets a lot of our money. Oh, uh, that's news to me. We gotta look into that. Uh, I'm just going by, uh, your, I'm going by your city annual report. So, um, you know, there's usually the libraries, right? Is the other taker, and your parks. And there's usually a, maybe a, a, a college, there's, a, there's usually a public college. In, in, in Chicago, it's the city colleges. But basically, that's, those are the people who are, uh, you know, you're funding, right? So if you take out your property tax bill, I mean, you're going to see these entities on here. And that's the deal. It's not like you can say, like, well, I don't have kids in school, so I don't want to pay this. Can I keep that part? Can we do that? No. no. Uh, I'm a law-abiding citizen. The likelihood of me breaking the law or needing a policeman is low. I don't want to pay this part. That's weird. You can't opt out, you know, because 
you don't use the schools or you know I, I don't use public transit or whatever whatever your individual story may be so therefore we must be mindful of anything that takes a dollar of property tax off the table that's the point I'm making here if these units of government need this dollar to operate for good or ill anything that diverts the dollar of property tax must be watched closely you agree Yes. okay now whether you whether you like the way the government is run or not that's a matter for another night but this is just how the bills are paid now there's obviously other forms of you know there's the sales tax and there's grants and there's all the, obviously there's other ways that our units of government get money but we're talking here tonight really just about this one very powerful source the property tax all right back to our mythical example here now, this is year zero. Now in year one, as I'm doing my project, we now have 101 properties because my property is now online and it is therefore being taxed. Whereas it was, there was nothing to be taxed before, now there is. And maybe somebody else built something over here and maybe property values are rising anyway. So it may be in the first year, instead of 1,000, we have $1,100 in property taxes. That $100 is the increment. That's the increment that the TIF district collects. And down here in year, now remember with this is 23 years. So down here in year 15, there could be 200 properties for all we know, and it could be $5,000 in property taxes. You follow? Mm -hmm. It's just things are growing, things are good. So. The difference between when we started and now where, we're, where we are in our little mythical story is $4,000, you see, right? Who gets the $4,000? The, the, the TIF, that's it. That's the point we want to make. So as long as we're clear on that, we can, we can move forward. Um, TIFs are created, as I say, um, you know, by a local municipality and there's a joint review board that must be convened to pass a TIF <clears throat> and the joint review board consists of members of the other taxing bodies so there's a representative and they must pass by majority vote to, to authorize a TIF to go forward. <clears throat> and then the local government, your, in this case your city council, would pass a law uh, to, to, to make the TIF happen. So as I say, this is a state law that allows the thing to happen, but it's triggered and managed by your city. <clears throat> now, back to this question about blight. Um, there's a list of uh, factors in the state statute. Uh, I think there's um, 14 factors, and you've got to satisfy five of them. <clears throat> and uh, there's other, there's other uh, uh, provisions as well. Uh, some rural areas are declared in blight. This is, might be more appropriate for out here. Uh, it's often found that in some towns across America, a cornfield is declared blighted so a Walmart can move in. And then the developer gets a lot of money to, to build a Walmart where there was a perfectly fine cornfield. And the question is, you know, is that blight? You know, but they manage to, to, to make it flexible enough so that, so that they can wear the, that set of pants. So this is the, you know, the famous triangle that you often see when you discuss TIFs. The, this is the base that we mentioned before, you know, in our mythical example, that was the $1,000 of property taxes that were being collected uh, before we got started. So that's the $1,000 that was collected by this particular set of properties. Now what you've got to see here is it's flat. So notwithstanding the rise in costs of anything, cost of living, cost of labor, cost of materials, the units of government, which are, that we pointed out here, right there, they're not getting a raise. They're getting what, that $1,000 is flat for 23 years. So that's the, we're getting to start to see a, 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 some of the policy implications when we put TIFs into place. Um, so this here is amenable to budgeting processes. So the, 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 the money that is, is collected uh, from all the properties in your area are part of the calculations that the mayor and other people make when they figure out, well, what can we do here next year? What's our priorities? 
we want to build a new library, we want to have a festival, we want to start a remediation program for kids who can't read. Whatever the priorities are of your government are going to be reflected in budgets that you and your representatives supposedly can look at. Now in Chicago, it's a sharp, it's a farce. You know, we really, as I mentioned, it's very hard for us to impact that process, but it, there is a, a little moment of opportunity in Chicago for, for the citizen to try to understand and impact the budgeting process. But maybe here in a smaller community, you, it's, it might be more friendlier, it might be easier, and people might know each other, and therefore it's more, maybe more amenable to, to, to public pressure when they say, you know, we don't like that, don't build a skating ring, we want a, we want a new library, or whatever. These things that happen in public life, uh, when budgets are published and when you ask the mayor or other people, well, what do you want to do for 2016 and 2017? And that's when you have these, these public conversations and it gets, it gets actualized in the budget. So all that is here, is what I call on the books. But this TIF stuff happens off the books. That's one of the policy problems with the TIF program because this money is available to your mayor um, in a way that makes it very easy to dispense um, in what I call the dead of afternoon, not the dead of night, but in meetings that happen in the afternoon when nobody's around and you read about in the funny papers. Um, so at the end of the 23 years, the TIF goes away and then all the money, this is all the tax money that's collected by our TIF district, now returns to those units of government. That's our, our friends here at the end of 23 years. So that's how TIFs work. It's like, um, think of it, it's like a skim. It's off the top. So anybody been to Vegas, you know? In the old days, the mob was very active in Vegas, and they would skim winnings. So they would take the money from the casino and the slots down to the counting room and skim, you know, a bunch of money and put it in bags in a closet, and it would go off to the, you know, the mob bosses. And the casino owners were told, Here's how we, you know, here's, here's, here's the takings, but it was absent the skim. So they might have thought they had a great night. Hey, we, we made like $900,000 last night in the casino, and that's great, but they didn't know about the 100000 that's in the shoebox on the way to Havana. Well, the TIF is like that. The TIF takes his money off the top, and then everyone else gets fed. Okay, and uh, as we say here in, in, uh, in uh, Woodstock, 60% of your property tax dollars is for the school district 200. The city itself gets about 16 cents. McHenry, about 9%, 9 cents. Your community college, <coughs> the townships, and uh, your other units, your parks, etc. So this is where your dollar goes, except when there's a TIF involved. So as soon as a TIF comes to town, this gets a little thrown out of kilter. And now we're going to, we're going to, get a little more into that as we, as we reveal you the details. Um, as I say, the blighting factors uh, are flexible, but they usually include something like age, obsolescence, code violations, vacancies, and overcrowding. Um, they also have to pass the but-for test, so they're related, which means that unless the project gets this public money, it can't happen. It's like, the mar like I say, the market has failed, and but for the infusion of public money, your project could not happen. So if a, a, a project is being proposed for TIFs that looks like it, it, it's a perfectly sensible commercial project, you have to ask yourself, are you, uh, have you passed the blight? Like, is this area truly blighted? Like, a, would a common sense person say this is blighted? And, the, the, just as important, why can't the market support this project? I mean, why can't you just go to a bank to, to get a loan and roll the dice, because this is a capitalist society, the last time I checked, you take your risk, right, and build your thing, whatever it is, sell your stuff, whatever it is you're selling, and you make a profit, you reward your stockholders and your employees, and you move on, and, and you have a great time. Or you fail. You take a risk, and the thing that you built that you wish to make money off of, it just doesn't satisfy the public and you go belly up. And that happens too, right? That's part of the game of, of commerce. Okay, but this but-for thing is, is um, you know, consultants make a lot of money uh, 
proving blight and the bud forest. So there's a whole cottage industry of people who make their living, you know, kind of threading the eye of the needle and the camel is threading, you know, the camel's holding the needle. I'm not sure what the met metaphor is, but, um, you know, we need to be mindful of, of these standards. And Chicago, where I live, is, is TIF gone crazy. 32% of the city of Chicago is in a TIF district. Um, and no other city has it quite as bad as we do. And um, so I, I use the image of the Frankenstein monster. You know, it's like the scientist creates the thing for good. It's like, let it be alive and I will control it. It will be good. And then the thing break, breaks, you know, breaks its chains, you know, kills the scientists, throws, sets the village on fire, and oh my God, the whole thing is gone topsy-turvy. The thing that you created, you can't control it. You know, it's that image. <clears throat> and so in, in Chicago, we have 150 TIF districts. And in 2014, they extracted $426 million in property taxes. That's almost a half billion dollars of money gone missing. Since TIFs came to Chicago, they've extracted $7 billion. And it's a fair question to ask, what happened to that money? Where did it go? That's part of what the TIF Illumination Project is trying to figure. We're answering that question. It's, hist it's historical data. Some of it is impossible. But we're going we're gonna to wrestle that baby to try to give the people of Chicago a, a thorough accounting. And again, to carry on our, <laughs> our movie monster, you know, Mr. Tiff is trashing our city. Um, what the Tiff Elimination Project has done for the city of Chicago is we, we have been able to find out how much money is sitting in the Tiff accounts at the end of the last year, because each Tiff has a bank account. So in this conversation about are we broke, at least in Chicago, it's very germane to ask how much of our property taxes are sitting in these little piggy banks. Are you sitting down? Yes. What the records show, the audience is sitting down. This is how much was sitting in the TIF accounts in Chicago at the end of 2014. Do I hear a collective intake of breath? <laughs> yeah, $1.4 billion is a lot, of a lot of change sitting somewhere in some body's bank accounts earning we don't know what interest in the city of Chicago at the beginning of 2015. Well, we made that public and that made news. That's, that's making news to this day. And the mayor has, has said to me publicly that I'm right, but he's, he's got it all taken care of. Trust him. <laughs> all this money is well spoken for. It can't be released into the, it can't be used to solve the problems that are plaguing the city of Chicago right now. It can't be used to help our schools or health clinics or other things uh, that people are, are, are crying for because he says the money is spoken for. So we're in a tug of war right now, myself and the mayor's office, for them to come clean and prove it to us. And they haven't done that yet, but we're, we're, we're in that fight right now. Um, so it's a big deal across the state of Illinois, my friends. We're talking about over 1,200 TIFs across 550 cities, and you're, you're one of them. And as I say, it's not as crazy, you know, in some places in Illinois as, as it is in Chicago, but anywhere there's a TIF, I think we're gonna have these conundrums, these policy problems that we're speaking of here tonight, uh, more or less. And there is no one place to go, I have to tell you, if you wanted to ask yourself, well, how big a deal is it in Illinois? You know, I mean, like we're gonna, you're getting the picture here today in some detail, we're going down into the weeds, but is there something that you could do for the whole state? No, we're building one, but there really, there really isn't. Uh, our, the data that we have is a little outdated, but since TIFs came to Illinois, they've extracted over $14 billion in property taxes. And this information is already outdated, so I would say take this number and turn it into a 16 billion. Again, that's property tax dollars. We're not talking about magic beans or strange money from Washington. This is just our most basic uh, rudimentary, uh, uh, I guess the, the atomic level, I guess, 
of, of, of civic finance is your property tax dollars. And remember, this country was started over people messing with our taxes, remember? <laughs> you need a, it's like we got all up in arms, you know? They were taking our tax, they were taxing us and moving our money around and they were, weren't being straight with us and they were, we, you know, that got us, got us in a, in a, in a passel of trouble. And we, you know, we severed our relations with the mother country. We had a revolution. I don't know if, if we're ready to have another revolution over this, but I put it on the table for your consideration. Now, how big a deal is this across the whole country? Again, I wish there was one place to go to tell you, but it's my own estimation that it could be as big as $20 billion in property taxes gone every year across thousands and thousands of districts across the entire country. And if we use the rule of thumb of 50 cents of the, tax, of the property tax dollar is supposed to go to the public education, like you guys are a little high, if we use that rule of thumb, then public education in America is being deprived of $10 billion every year across this country. To me, that's a headline. I don't know. It's a headline somewhere. Right. So, yeah, great question. <clears throat> so, like you said, the, the, the annual report for the city says that for every dollar that's collected, it should be 67 cents. Except, what about that TIF? Well, we're going we're gonna to factor that in in a second. But you're right. When a, TIF is come to, when a TIF is in town, these numbers must be adjusted for the TIF takings. They're off each one of those? They are. They're taking their money first. And then the school will get 67% of what's left. Can I? Yeah. Okay. Sure, sure. Okay. And I've worked with TIF districts. Okay. I do agree that some of these locations that they call blighted, that are farm fields and things like that, that developers end up getting money back, that's going above and beyond. But a TIF, what it's established for, is an area that will not increase any tax in that area unless investment comes there. You've seen areas that are downtrodden and buildings that are boarded up and downtowns that look like crap. And then these kinds of things allow people to make an investment, and then that amount that is increased is by that investment. Those tax dollars then go back to the district to continue infrastructure improvements and then continue to grow more investment. It's a positive thing if it's used properly. I think it's gone above and beyond as far as the way some municipalities mm -hmm, are using mm -hmm. it. Another thing you mentioned is that municipalities are paid for property tax. That is not always the case. The, prop, or the uh, municipality I was working for did not collect property taxes. Um, the taxing bodies do, mm. um, but they thrived or they were funded through um, the retail tax dollars. Okay. There are communities that do not collect. Okay, fair enough. And those monies are reinvested so that there's a road there for that next building to be built. Or the, the plumbing, or, or I mean, the uh, you know underground mm -hmm. infrastructure mm -hmm. is there. So another <clears throat> company can come in and create jobs and bring more investment into the community. It's a very positive thing. I, I'm having a hard time with it. Well, uh, yes. I mean, as you say, it, in, the idea has merit, but I'm reporting on what it is. You can decide if if it's working for you or not. The experiences that I've had is the opposite of, of your dialogue, but that is, the, that, is the, that is the defense of TIFs, that you, it's used for blighted areas, and, and the question is, what is blight? But so you're calling it skimming. It's not skimming, because those dollars would not there be an additional investment in this, in this area. Well, the response is, your area, depending on what you're talking about, could be growing anyway. And so uh, the rebuttal to that argument is, you are mistaking coincidence for causality. And the professors that, have, that I've talked to, which have studied these, this issue extensively, tells us that communities that have TIFs, compared to communities that don't have TIFs, it's a wash, or at least, or, and in some cases, they do worse than communities without TIFs. So in the case of Chicago, um, the people who defend TIFs say, look at, the, look at the West Loop, it's going crazy, and it's heavily TIFed. Well, they're mistaking 
um, a, a coincidence for causality. The, the, the West Loop is hot and the TIFs are still there. So the TIFs are still fun, funding developers in a red hot community. So are there instances in, 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 uh, in the world of economic development where a, a TIF is, is really did what it was supposed to do? I'm quite sure. But you guys need to understand all the factors to be able to weigh in and say whether you think it's a fair trade-off. Because it is, it, 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 when the TIF is collecting money, um, it is diverting funds from these, in, these entities. And that, it's, it's and, not if those, if those extra tax dollars would not be generated because of the blight. Well, we can't go back in time. See, this is a problem that the professors t tell us. You can't go back in time and have the same community with the TIF and without and, and say, well, look, see, here it is 20 years later, the community is shit. So you, you were right to have had that TIF. So we, let's go back in time and put the TIF, you can't do it. So if you do have a part of your city that's, that is, like you say, was boarded up, the public conversation has to be, and it, everyone needs to weigh in, including the parents, is, is this a good use of, of public money? Yeah. The end of that time yeah. I have a question. Um, did California abandon? They did. Okay. Yeah. So they dropped it. They did. They started and they dropped they it. it. They did. They Jerry Brown came in and he he got there was a court case, but they ended the tips and the money went back into the treasury and it really helped them out. But yeah, there's a st situation where there was a huge, huge economic player in the in the state of California. Okay. Well, they, but they passed the law, you know, at, in the state house to end TIFs. So the, the enabling statute is at the state level. You at the, in the city, like in the city of Chicago, if the city council had the majority vote, they could sunset all their TIFs. They couldn't sunset your TIFs. They couldn't sunset like Evanston TIFs. But the city council has the power to control its own little world. But if, 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 the, if the governor got into his head, like Governor Brown did, the TIFs are bad across the whole state, and he could convince a majority of your legislators, as uh, Brown did, then they could kill all the TIFs across the state, just like that. Yeah. So on our tax bill, we don't have any information telling us. Well, that's another question. Now, if you live in the TIF district, we're, we're going to get to the specifics of your TIF in a minute, but if you live in the TIF district, that's the question. Does it say downtown TIF on your tax bill. In, in Chicago, in Illinois, or I should say rather in Cook County, up until last summer, it did not. So the tax bills in Cook County were lying to people for, for, for eternity. So you would see in the county of Cook, you'd see a tax bill from someone who lived in a TIF. You'd see the name of the TIF. And I remember in, in Chicago, there's 150. In Exerving Cook County, there's another um, 240. 20, so there's like about 440 TIFs in the whole county of Cook. So um, if you lived in one of those TIFs, you'd see the name of the TIF, like Kinsey TIF District, and then a zero. So it would be like, well, what is that? You know, I mean, so I never heard of a TIF, but I apparently, I apparently am in one, but what's the difference? It says zero. So you know, in other words, next to all these numbers uh, where it said uh, school board getting so much and library getting so much, there'd be TIF with zero. That changed as of last July when Cook County Clerk David Orr put the real numbers on. And so you saw they went down. So when you were in your, if you're living in a TIF district, last year you, you were giving $1,000 to your, to your units of government and the, the, the schools were getting $600. That was right there on your bill. This year, you look at your same bill you realize that that TIF district that was taking zero, it's taking 90%. Uh, and that's true for over 21 TIF districts in the city. So now that thousand <coughs> said $900 to TIF, and 50% of 100 would be $50 to the Board of Ed. So that's a major difference on a tax bill. And so some people can have several TIFs on their tax bill. 
Well, it is only no. no your own, your property is in, is either is lo, is geolocational, so the TIFs do not overlap. So you're either in one or not. Now, if you own more than one property, you could be. If you have TIFs present, the taxing bodies understand this, and it creeps your rates up. And as I mentioned in Cook County, it's an impact of 11 percent. So one way to, to think about TIFs, at least in Cook County, is if you made them all go away, I'd get 11 percent more in my pocket. And I don't know about you, but yeah, you know, my, my property tax bill is, is, is pretty steep. You know? So I got a townhouse in Lincoln Park, so good for me. Well, you know, if you go back 10 years, 11 percent times, you know, that's a new car. That's a, va that's a new house. That's send my kid to college. I mean, that's it's very considerable. And again, that's not a conversation that we have. So at the end of the TIF, now a TIF can be ended prematurely by the will of the mayor, which happened in Chicago because uh, the, the TIF that was in the loop was so controversial that Mayor Daley canceled it beforehand, and then you have a pot of money. So um, one solution is you, you disperse the, the money that's left in the TIF back to the units of government that would have gotten it anyway according to this distribution. So it's like a one-time gift. So if there's a <clears throat> there's a if there's a thousand dollars in the pot, then you know your schools would have gotten like six hundred seventy dollars or something like that. So that's how it would work. Uh, but um, the mayor can also put some other rules on it. So in Chicago, they put another rule on top of all this, and and, they, and it was like a twenty percent rule. They just said if that happened, if that if that thousand dollars became available, we're only taking two hundred dollars of it. And distributing it, the other 800 were holding, and they just made that rule up. So, again, depends on you know how your government works. Okay, these are these are great questions. I really appreciate it. So let's try to get a little particular now. <clears throat> in Woodstock, we have the downtown TIF that was created in 1997, and is set to expire in 2020. Uh, is, I, is there, I hear that maybe some talk of extending it? Yeah. So that's, that's kind of on the table. Yeah. All right, in which case it could go to uh, 2032. Uh, so here's the, the boundaries. This is from the original planning document uh, that was uh, uh, from, from the 1997. And so you see, you see this, this location with some of these other landmarks down here. So, this TIF has captured six million one hundred and one thousand two hundred one dollars through 2014. So that's how much money TIF District One has has captured six million one hundred thousand. It's spent nine million one hundred thousand. So it's taken in six and spent nine. There's two series of bonds that I could see uh, in two different years, series D, E, and G, um, and uh, so far, you've spent about $2.3 million on financing to the UMB bank because of that indebtedness. You spent $1 million on the Woodstock Station project. You spent $3 million on public infrastructure, which is everything from roads, traffic lights, other things. You purchased um, 409 Clay Street from William Saws for $437,000 in 2003. And at the beginning of this year, you had $912,714 left in your TIF account. <coughs> so you owe, obviously, this TIF owes. And this is, this is typical because back in the day when the TIF was created, there was some, some thoughts to have various projects, like maybe we're going to improve the town square or we're going to redo the opera house. Or maybe, there must have been a lot of plans floating around. But one plan did come, come through, uh, and that was for the, um, no. Yeah, so this is, this is remember we said it was um, about 60% for your, for your schools? So 60% of $6 million is $3.6 million. So you could argue, it seems to me, that your school district 200 has been deprived of $3.7 million by this TIF. It's money that they, it seems to me they should have gotten. Now, oh, I know the point I wanted to make to this gentleman. When, when you're talking about school, uh, units of government accommodating each other, often what happens 
uh, is when a TIF is being proposed, the mayor or the city manager will go to the school superintendent and say, look, I got this great plan for whatever, and we're going to put a TIF in, but let's make a deal. Don't, don't uh, pee in my lemonade. You know, don't, don't make, a, make a fuss over this, and I will, I will make you whole. I will give you some money around the side. <clears throat> and so you have, many, you have sort of many extracurricular deals made between these two units of government, the village mayor and the school superintendent of the school district, but it's not as much money as the school district would have gotten without the TIF, but it's more money than the district would have gotten had they not made the deal. And these deals are also made in the dead of the afternoon, and I think that they should also be exposed yeah. and discussed because, again, it's the taxpayers and the parents that are in this fight or in this mix or transaction, if you want to talk, talk, talk about it as a civic transaction. Deals are being done that you don't know about. All right, so this is, this is, this is you know, what's the impact of, of the tip that you have here. These are the costs that I have here. So you can just see every year, going back to, to, to as far back um, as we go, uh, we don't actually have the first few years of documentation, but I'm going to say they were probably all zeros. So when the TIF district started actually spitting off money, as you see every year, this is how much the TIF generated, and this is the current balance. These are the expenditures every year. Now, the, the project that we did roll the dice on is the Woodstock Station. Uh, how did that work out for you? So this was the... The die, the, the fa this was the site of the old factory, right? That was very famous and, you know, was part of your history here and they tore it down some years ago. And created, um, you know, I, I think part of the reason why the TIF was created possibly was to, was to get something going here. So what happened? The, the, the project was developed by Bob Hummel of Hummel Group from Palatine. The city sold the land to him for $500,000. The TIF was used to clean up the spot because it was, you know, pretty, pretty dirty. Uh, lay down infrastructure, so I mean, you know, we have, you know, these things. You got to, you got to make sure there's a sewer line and things of this kind. Uh, it was supposed to include 59 townhomes and about uh, 150 or so condos plus a 60,000 foot retail. Uh, and 10 townhomes were built. And in 2009, it was foreclosed. This unit you know, right now is listing for about a quarter of a mil, one of them. Um, but the Barrington Bank walked away with this whole thing for 1.25 million. So here we have another one of these consequences of this whole TIF situation. You guys acted as the bankers for the developer, this guy. Yep. Now, to, to the point of, you know, was this... It, what, this was like a, a ruined building. It was no one was using. So this was blighted, I guess you could say. Like it was a factory. So this is the TIF. This is the TIF saying maybe this is the TIF at its best, perhaps. Yeah. You know, what are we going to do with this thing? It's it's a polluted place. It's a icky place. It's wearing us down. You know, it makes Woodstock look like um, a slum. Blah blah blah. It's, you know, it's it's sad to see because it used to be great and now it's sad. So what are we going to do with it? So it's a good. It's a it's a very good. Naughty question. So let's make a TIFF. And Bob comes along and he says, here, look, these, these are beautiful. And he shows these plans. And I'm sure there was a city council meeting where people looked at these plans and went, ooh, ah, you know, and the, and the, the drawings for the retail. Oh, there's going to be a Starbucks. You know, so, OK, let's, let's roll the dice. <coughs> well, it didn't work out. You're stuck with the bonds. you got to pay them back. UMB Bank is not going away. The notes that you took to make all this happen is holding, is, is present, and it's a debt that you are responsible for. Now, what happened to this guy? I tried to find him. I, I couldn't, I mean, maybe you guys know where he is, or um, he's had other projects. Yeah, he's working on another tip. He's working on another tip. Yes, sir. Okay, so he's known to you, he's known to some of you. So anyway, he, I mean, there was a big legal proceeding that the, the, the judgment was against him, and so, you know, he's out of the picture. 
Now comes the Bank of Barrington. Woo, who, what? Whatever they are, whoever owns the Bank of Barrington, now is calling the shots on this. So I'd say they got a deal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they got a great deal, courtesy of you. Now, when, when the court settled this, and they sorted all the debts and the obligations, and you know, they sort of wiped the slate clean, I guess, you know, at the end of the court situation, Bob, he's, he goes away. You know, his, his hands are clean. He's, he doesn't owe anything, right? He's passed over the property to the bank. Now they're the title holder. They can build whatever they want there, right? It's clean, it's remediated, so they got a deal. Did you get any of this money? Were you at the table? No. Now, that's an unfortunate situation, but suppose it had gone the other way. Suppose, suppose this had been super duper famous and fantastic, and that every one of these would have been a townhouse, and there's your, there's your mall with the Starbucks. Suppose that had happened, and Bob, this guy Bob sells it not for a loss, not, but suppose he sells it for 10 million. Do you get any of that? No. no. So this is another one of the kind of unsung stories of TIFFs. When, when, and, and this happens over and over again. You act as a banker, like a silent partner for developers, who then flip the properties, and they walk away with profit, including the money you gave them. Now you can say, well, that's a fair return. You know, maybe that's just the game. You know, the, the, the developer took the risk and put some of his money in. Right, and you, as the city, or as the urban, uh, or as the civic entity, put your money at play too because you wanted to see this done. You know that's the public good. You wanted to see this done, so you're willing to put your public money in, and then kind of adios muchachos, and uh, you know he, his project works out and he sells it for a huge fortune. Good for him, Bob. Now go off and build something else somewhere. Take your profits, take including our money. Go with God. I don't know about you, but that makes me mad. <laughs> and it happens a lot. It happens quite a lot in Chicago, and and I'm not sure how, how how often it happens in other jurisdictions. As I say, we're just moving outside of the city boundaries of Chicago. And I should say, the stories that we find in Chicago maybe I hope are not indicative of how tips work everywhere in the city in the state of Illinois, but we have yet to see. And as the lady pointed out, it could work out in other jurisdictions just fine. You know, it should be, could be all above board and it's all working well. I haven't found any yet, but we only just starting to look. All right, part of what I want to tell you about is organizing around TIFFs. So I'm going to give you a little more information and then we, you know, we can wrap this thing up and get to questions and answers. Nearby TIFFs in the news. <laughs> um, the Virginia Street Tax District, which is not here, but is nearby, um, they're building these things, and that apparently aggrieved Cal so much that he put it in his blog. So he's, he's aggravated yeah. <laughs> that $64,000 of property tax money is being spent on these things. Now, where'd that come from? Who knows? <laughs> you know, but it's, it's a small example of why TIFFs are called slush funds, you know, why, why they're vulnerable to that characterization, because things get built with them and nobody can really understand why they built this. Um, and you know, if you want to get really uh, down, in the, down in, the, in, the, in, the, in the weeds, you would say, well, you know, who, was, who, who laid the concrete? Who, you know, who, was the, who was the contractor that got that job? And you know, I'm not saying that it's true, but oh my God, it's the brother of the county commissioner, or it's the, the nephew of the mayor or something. God forbid that should happen. Anyway, Cal is pissed off about this, so I thought you should see it. Now, uh, not, not too far away from here, at uh, one, Route 47 and 176, you see a blighted area, apparently, that needs a TIF in order to have something called the Chicagoland Sportsplex Incorporated to go ahead and build a sports complex there using TIF money. Now again, is that the smartest use of public money? I don't know. The people in that community, and maybe some of you are neighbors, or maybe some of you are from over that way, maybe you can have a conversation with the mayor or the planners down there as to why the guys who want to build this thing just can't build it and charge whatever they want. You know, put 100 tennis courts there or skeet shooting or whatever it is that, that would be in such a facility. And I have to say, 
the public financing of sports complexes is a huge racket. It's a huge racket all over America, whether it's a stadium like we got in Chicago, where, we, where the citizens of Chicago spent $425 million to build um, the spaceship that's crashed into Soldier Field, where they play, what, 13 games a year? Yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's crazy. I mean, the McCaskey family, they're gazillionaires. Well, in, in Chicago and in cities all over America, the McCaskies and their, and their brethren make the case to the city fathers that sports stadiums are economic drivers, and that's BS. It's not true. But it's used as an excuse to give public subsidy to the McCaskies and their, their, their friends who are building you know, billion-dollar stadiums everywhere. Um, you know, and the, 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 the most egregious example is in the World Cup and Olympics where in Brazil they put a sports stadium for a billion dollars in the jungle that you can't even get to. You have to take a boat to it. But you can imagine how much money the contractors make for those projects, but usually the people lose. Well, you may have the same situation. It's not as bad as putting a, a stadium in the jungle. But I would look into this if I were you. I would ask some serious questions. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, could it could be changed up? I don't know. Uh, this is this is as a result of the search I did. This is from January 2015. That failed twice. Huh? That's failed twice. It's failed. Okay. Okay. Well, it's in the news. I just wanted to bring it up because these things. Th th that's how this thing rolls. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's we can put that on the table when we get to the to when we conclude the presentation. Let's 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 park that issue. So there's a there's a potential uh, TIF uh, issue, and if you uh, build housing and there's more children, there's for the the school district is going to be burdened with, with somebody has to teach those children, but they're going to have to do it with less money. All right, so that's that's in the news. Um, now, not too far away, School District 300 um, has uh, 10 cities in it, including Crystal Lake, Algonquin, West Dundee, um, Carpentersville, Sleepy Hollow, etc. And they have seven TIFs, including the Sears TIF, the famous Sears TIF that was given to them when Sears moved out of the city of Chicago. So our research discovered that uh, those TIFs from District School District 300 deprive them of $17 million in one year. So school district 300 is the sixth largest in Illinois with 23,000 children. And they, they have to make do with, somehow they had to balance their books by either, either raising their rates or doing without. A little oh, further away in Cook County in a, an African American community called Harvey, it's a very small town, but yet they have one, two, three, four, five, seven tips. And they have taken out of Harvey $35 million. Oh my God. $35 million of property taxes off the table in the village of Harvey, which is very small and not affluent. Yeah. Now, one of the projects that was created from, from Harvey TIF is, again, illustrative of, of this deal making that I told you about. Um, Harvey TIF number five sends at least $3 million to something called MSMC Investments for the renovation of St. Francis Hospital in 2011. So this was this, this was this hospital owned by the Sisters of Charity. It wasn't going very well. In fact, the sisters sold it to them for $1. Then these investors, these guys, put about $23 million into the property to spruce it up, and they rebranded it as Metro South Medical Center. So here it is, sort of with a new facade and a new branding. That happened in 2011. <clears throat> Four years later, they flipped it. And these are the investors, Falcon Investors from Harrison, New York, and Transition Healthcare uh, 
are these guys. Well, after that investment of 23 million, the owners flipped the hospital for $40 million. It's a profit of $17 million or 74%. Show me how I can get 74% return and I'm there. <laughs> I'll take my wallet out, <laughs> I'll sign my house over to you. Show me how I can get 74% return on my investment. The new owner is Franklin, Tennessee-based Community Health Systems. So they walk away with $17 million, including the $3 million given to them by the good people of Harvey. And again, uh, Harvey folks don't even get a Band-Aid <laughs> for their trouble. Uh, but these guys now are operating it, and they, they could flip it yet again, right? Healthcare is a going concern. These folks could... Uh, you know, keep it going and, and get, you know, get, I'm sure they're looking to, to, to uh, you know, ma maximize their investment. And we may yet read about that. All right, let me just conclude by giving you three what I think are huge policy issues with TIFs, regardless of where they are. Number one, <clears throat> TIFs hoard taxes in prosperous communities. It may not be as uh, obvious in a smaller place, uh, uh, like, a, like a Woodstock or a Barrington, but essentially, because TIFs are supposed to be spent in the district that they're created, by and large, um, it tends to handcuff money. And this, this slide uh, here is, is of the city of Chicago that shows where TIF spending is red hot, and that's, where, that's in the loop, in the West Loop. So TIFs are dumping money. TIF, TIF money is being collected and being spent in areas that are already prosperous. But areas in Chicago, nor, near, notably the west sides and the south sides that are heavily African American are starved of TIFs. So that's why I have this handcuffs here. TIF money is handcuffed. But if your city is small, this may not be that big a deal. But in a, in a large landmass like the city of Chicago, it's anti-distributive. So money, tax, taxes that are collected here have to stay here. But the need for building and infrastructure may be down there. We may need par parks down here. There may be a lot of Latinos with families who need parks, but yet they can't get one because the money that's being collected here is being spent here, so we're going to have more parks there, to take an example. So there's, that's an, I think that's an issue of equity, you know, when you're looking at how money is spent, how you're collecting taxes, and where you're spending them in your city. Two, according to the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, that's been looking at land as, as a, for, for decades, they say this in a book called Rethinking Property Tax Incentives for Business. They say, our message is simple. Please, please, if you're going to offer incentives, don't give them to every firm that asks. Don't. 90% of the time, they don't work, and handing them out after a company has already located in an area without them makes no sense at all. But that actually describes Chicago's TIF policy perfectly. And you hope that it doesn't describe yours. And finally, number three, school districts sue mayors. Taxpayers lose twice. So what you're seeing is the deals that I've described to you um, sometimes go south. And the accommodations that there are made sometimes by the school superintendent with the mayor don't always work out as promised. And in some cases across America, the superintendent then lawyers up and sues his mayor. Oh. And now you have the strange situation <clears throat> of the taxpayers paying both ends yes. <clears throat> of the lawsuit. Yes. You're prosecuting and defending at the same time. And in the city of uh, Oak Park, that's exactly what happened. School District 200 uh, sued the village over a TIF deal gone south. And after $600,000 of legal fees, they settled out of court. Uh, it was dragged through the papers. Everybody looked really stupid. I mean, the, the both, all parties looked horrible in the press. But that's a lot of library books that weren't bought. Right. That's a fire truck, right? I mean, that's, who knows what $600,000 could have done for the good people of Oak Park. Um, Sharon Pachak Lehman was a member, uh, and is a, uh, to this day, a member of the, D, the, D, the D200 school board. She said, Economic development is not the business of school districts. <clears throat> Education is. TIFs take dollars from schools. The best economic development lo localities can do is provide great education. When dollars from education go into these deals, the game never comes out favorably for students. So says Sharon. 
And unfortunately, this is a trend that's happening all over the country. So this is Oak Park. Oak Park schools settle TIF lawsuit, but here in South Carolina, Pickens County and school district suing city. <clears throat> in Ohio, the South Range district sues Salem over TIF revenues. And over in Wakanda, school district 118 is suing Lakemore over two different. Now they have to be doing this for a reason, and not frivolous lawsuits. It's because the, notwithstanding the accommodation that the, the superintendent and the mayor try to have with one another, I mean, they play golf together after all. I mean, they have lunch together. They're supposed to work together to, to, make, to make for a good local government. So you don't want to get in each other's gravy. But even notwithstanding, you, you're seeing lawsuits everywhere because somebody has de decided that it's not a good deal for the schools. Uh, and so that is a, a, a policy prescription that, you know, I think we should be mindful of. Uh, that concludes my presentation, folks. I, I want to offer uh, a DVD for sale later on for $10. You have a TIF 101 on here and some other helpful things that will be available for your consideration. So thank you for your patience, and I guess we'll turn it over to the chair for Q&A and further comments. Thank you so much. Thanks, Give a hand to Tom. Thank you very much.